Еще более высокий уровень поражения называется... An even higher level of energetic damage is called a curse. Curse is a spoilage of a higher order. And this one is indeed similar to a cancerous tumor. That is how it works. When a particular cell changes its functionality, and instead of following the regular program of maintaining the vital functions, begins to divide itself rampantly, spreading itself wherever it can. This is how a curse works. A curse works on the causal body and the buddhic bodies. And same as spoilage doesn't manifest itself straight away. And in order for a curse to slip into one's consciousness, a third force that would make this program for you would not be enough. Here you would have to pass the approval of very serious egregorial levels. Meaning that here, the fact that a program has been made would not be enough. It must also pass a certain level of verification, such as does it actually have a right to exist. Therefore, cursing someone without fault would not be possible. There should be an actual offense committed against a higher standing, necessarily a higher standing consciousness or a system, caste-wise, which has clearly received harm from your actions. A curse is the flip side of a vow. If you swore something, or took vows, for example, to the gods, or to the government, if you swore an oath to those who depend on you, if you swore on your health, on the health of your children, it all will be heard 100%. It will be heard and will be registered as a certain condition of fulfilling an agreement. And if you break this vow, you get a curse in return. You broke an agreement, so the agreement no longer flows through you. And this means that the forces that were counting on this consciousness have suffered damages, and so they begin to compensate for their losses. And as a rule, it is impossible to compensate for this loss with just one life alone. The higher your agreement, for example with religion, with the government, the bigger the informational debt. And as a rule, if the curse is very strong, then even your children can end up paying for it. Generally, to the seventh generation, the atonement will take place. But such a life would be... Trust me, no one would want it. When you have to get bloody every time you want to achieve something. Something the regular people achieve effortlessly, someone who is cursed, he would have to put in an enormous effort. And generally, after some time, one gets discouraged, and then, Q, alcoholism, drug use, and all these other issues we have mentioned, all goes downhill from there. In ancient times, it used to be that you could only curse someone for breaking a vow, a vow that was given to your gods, to your tribe. Nowadays, Everything is definitely not as serious. But the principle remains the same. If your superiors are counting on you and you let them down, this will be a reason to be diminished and rise down to a zero. And if you don't have enough of your own rights left, then your children will have to redeem it. This is why sometimes cursed families, bloodlines, made agreements with the new god, for example. Take a very serious dynasty, for example. By knowing that they have been cursed, for example by shedding the blood of some royal family member, or for example for a coup, knowing that the curse is imminent, one of them would, for example, go away to a monastery, taking on the blame for his entire family. Meaning that here we see the activation of the Judeo-Christian principle of the scapegoat. A scapegoat is someone who was sacrificed to the demon Samael, or God Samael, depending on who he was perceived by. They tied a red string on the goat's horns and walked him up to a cliff. Then they pushed him off of the cliff. But before that, a 
rabbi or a Kohen would lay his hands on the goat and using a particular magical formula would pass on to him all the sins of the Judean folk, as if causing the entire Judean folk be cleansed of sin for this past year. And all this business went away with a red string that was tied around the goat's horns. So if any of you have been to Jerusalem, you probably have seen that upon approaching the Wailing Wall, there are certain gentlemen standing there in bright garments who approach the tourists in order to tie a red string around their wrist. So now ask yourself a question. Why do they go out of their way to do it? And it all comes down to this ritual. The sins are placed on the goats who came to a foreign land thinking that they have a right to do that. Such is their logic. And because of this, they can, through a mental sentencing, while tying a string around your wrist, you, a random giggling tourist girl, they could place on you a couple of their own problems, or a problem of their wife, or of the entire Judean folk. This could happen as well. Therefore, think twice before letting someone tie their strings on you for free. At the very least, give them a shekel. By doing this, you will as if buy your way out of this problem. But in any case, don't wear this string. Don't do it. So, the question of the transfer of sins belongs to this subject, this methodology. In the times prior to Christianity, prior to Judeo-Christianity, this method, it, of course, was not functional. You had to atone for it in action. This is why someone who broke a vow and carried the blame before the tribe was simply banned from the tribe. But banned not in order to take on the sins of others, but to atone for the problem in action. To atone for the loss and to do something that would compensate the tribe, something that would compensate for the loss and would glorify the tribe. For example, men would go on conquering quests, women would join other kings, other families, New towns were founded, meaning it happened in all sorts of different ways. A man could go into the woods for a year to hunt and return back in a year with a fine catch. Different ways. But never forever. This was not condoned. After all, own blood is own blood. As I already said, the caste system did not disappear. It exists. It just manifests itself a little bit differently. And the fat cat bureaucratic officials do not belong to a higher caste. They are artificially elevated by the government egregor. But if the government egregor happens to lower them, it will always take what's his. Therefore, try and learn to judge people according to the weight of their existential volume and whether it is artificially or non-artificially added and inflated inflated weight of the existential volume usually shows itself in a person of a high social status who behaves himself like a usual vampire victim, meaning someone who tries to expressively portray something out there, someone who prefers the latest models of luxury cars or homes with columns and lions, or golden toilets, an inflated ego, simply an inflated ego, same as the vampire, only on a different level. A person of a higher caste would never conduct herself that way. And it would be great if you learn to differentiate between people who have an inflated existential volume and those whose existential volume is natural. And of course, for yourself, try to cultivate exclusively natural personality traits which will elevate you in informational status without all these idiotic social antiques, which are never true and which only turn people into vampire victims, only on a slightly different level. Although there is such a thing as generational curse.
which depends but little on the individual. For example, the bloodline is cursed for seven generations, and you are in the third one. What can you do? The mechanism is quite simple here. The curse can be redeemed. It can be redeemed through a certain action, of course. An action that would neutralize the damage caused to someone as a result of which your kin has received the said curse. And for this, you will at the very least need to have the information, what for? One should, for example, fulfill a vow that was broken, the oath that was given by the oath-breaker. But in order to do that, you need to know what oath it was. You can also redeem it with money. The most important thing is that the one who grants you forgiveness would accept this money. By the way, this is the most simple method and the cheapest, believe me, the cheapest one. Money is the cheapest currency you can use for redeeming yourself. But what if there is no information? If you know that you're cursed, but your relatives are stonewall silent, or they simply don't know since their relatives kept in silence. Well, then you can take another oath, make an agreement with gods, an agreement with forces, a certain geish, that would neutralize the present transgression. In this case, the gods or the forces, they themselves will provide a clue. Take such and such commitment and carry it out throughout your life. Then your children won't have to pay for the sins of your grandparents. You can also receive forgiveness from the one who did the cursing, but again, you must know for what. Although what concerns generational curses, about the bloodline curse and the curse inflicted by the bloodline, we discuss the subject in more detail at our Power of the Bloodline course, as well as in the related book. It is all explained in there as well. I very much hope that it is all very clearly described. Bloodline curses, they usually come down as a heavy load during the change of epochs when one epoch replaces another. This is what happened in 1917, when the royal family was killed. Whatever the attitude towards Tsar Nikolai was, he wasn't killed alone, but his children were killed as well. And all the stories about that they actually killed some maids instead are just stories. They did kill the royals. And this curse, it of course settled on all royal subjects, meaning the entire folk. The members of the royal family are and have been considered as the ones who uphold the agreement, meaning they are anointed by God. And here, the talk is not only about Christianity, but in general, since every bloodline, every kin has its own gods. And they perfectly know which gods they are actually working with. When the killing of such a carrier happens, a carrier of such an agreement, the agreement itself gets interrupted, and the damage is received not by the person. The damage is received by the god who then starts to collect the tribute from all those involved in order to restore its rights. Therefore, it was naturally considered that a killing of a clergyman, the killing of a royal family member, and the killing of a child is a curse in of itself, is enough for the curse to settle onto the entire bloodline. The killing of a child in this case is the grounds to offend the mother goddess, because all children find themselves under her care, and a murder of a child is a direct insult to her. This comes with a severe punishment, severe ailments. But as a rule, it doesn't get passed on to offsprings. What is passed on to offsprings is the breaking of other rules, the infringement of other rights.